and welcome back to Dave's Creative Cave. I'm guessing you're here from my movie review of Sunset Boulevard, which was produced in 1950. Well then, for the next eight minutes, I will be your host, Dave Thornton. This film was written by three men. The first one was the director of the film, Billy Wilder. Then the second man was the producer, Charles Brackett. And then the third was a fellow by the name of D.M. Marshman. The stars of this film include William Holden as Joe Gillis, a broke, out-of-work screenwriter, Gloria Swanson as Norma Desmond, an aged and forgotten about silent film star who is filled with delusions of a great comeback, Erich von Stroheim as Norma's devoted butler, and Nancy Olsen as Betty Schaefer. Now a little history before we dive in. The time period this movie takes place is shortly after Hollywood made the jump from silent films to sound. When this happened, not all the talent made that transition for one reason or another. Sunset Boulevard, which is a real place, has been associated with Hollywood since its first studio went up in 1911. Now, during the 20s, the film industry's profits, as well as their salaries, rose to astronomical numbers. This led to a growing number of neighborhoods sprouting up, which boasted opulent mansions, unique automobiles, and exotic items, which is all displayed throughout this movie. Because, hey, they all had this abundance of money, and well, iPhones didn't exist back then. This movie is what they call an American Noir, which is a style of film that involves dark atmosphere, weird camera angles, hard shadows, and almost always, always involves a femme fatale. This is a cunning and ruthless sort of woman who is hell-bent on getting what she wants, when she wants, by any means often using her charm, her wits, and some sex. These women, they are usually provoked by lust, greed, or revenge. Kind of like Mike's wife. For the men who get caught in one of these fake towels webs, they have no chance of escape. This film was nominated for 11 Academy Awards and is regarded as one of the greatest movies ever made. It is currently ranked number 16 on the American Film Institute's Top 100 list. This film truly is an American classic. So the movie opens up with the scene of the lifeless body of Joe Gillis floating face down in a swimming pool that's at one of these larger than life mansions. The camera is angled up from the bottom of the pool gazing at and out beyond Joe's body to the police and spectators that are surfaced above. Now, if you have ever taken a camera underwater, you know it is not possible to see above the water's surface from below, such as in this scene. So what they had to do in order to capture this spectacular footage was to place a mirror at the bottom of the pool. Then they just focused the camera from above on the reflection in the mirror and that's how they were able to capture the body and everybody behind Joe from above. Very creative. So, with Joe's floating carcass face down in this pool, he starts to recollect by means of a flashback all the events that led up to his death. He ends up going back to six months earlier when he was falling behind on his rent, was late several months on his car note, to which now the repo man was hunting him down. He even tried to resell the script to Paramount to earn some cash, but was turned down again, partly because of Betty Schaefer. Uh, she was the script reader who screened all the scripts for approval. He is later fleeing from the repo man uh, in a small car chase scene when he runs into car trouble and discovers this rundown mansion off the side of the road to which he stashes his limp metal steed until the time was right. This is when, to his surprise, he meets the owner of the home, 
Norma Desmond, the aged and forgotten silent film star whom nobody, and I mean nobody, wanted to work with anymore. As it would turn out, she had written a script that she was convinced would launch her glorious comeback to Hollywood. And then Joe was able to convince her, for a price, that he could tweak it so that she could sell it to Paramount. Well, she demanded that Joe stay at the house while he worked on the script, and in doing so, moved him into the main quarters. As they worked on the script, she dug her clutches deeper and deeper into Joe as she spent enormous amounts of money uh, hosting private parties for just the two of them, showering him with gifts and clothes, and allowing him the use of her exotic sports car, and eventually proclaiming her love for him. When things start getting too real for him, Joe realizes he was, well, a gigolo or some kind of a kept man. So he tries to leave, but is drawn back to her by his guilt from her attempting to commit suicide for him abandoning her. So despite him having an eye for this younger, more attractive Betty Schaefer, He sticks it out with Norma. Now, Norma is contacted several times by an associate from Paramount after her butler, Max, delivered the script to Paramount. Because of her immense ego, she refuses the cause because it is not from her former director from the silent days. So, several weeks later, she makes a surprise visit to the studios where she runs into the security guard from her younger years. And then upon arriving at the studios, her old director does everything he can to dodge giving her a direct answer about her script and her return to film. Now she is so delusional that she takes all these dodges as a definite yes, even though it was never discussed. However, just outside, Max learned that the only reason Paramount was even calling her was to, re to rent her exotic car for a movie they just were making. At the same time, Joe is outside with Max and runs into, into the young Miss Schaefer, who ends up pleading for his help with writing a script. He declines, but eventually her persistence persuades him. I'm sure it was her persistence. So. Joe ends up moonlighting with Betty each night after Norma falls asleep. Eventually, Norma finds out because Joe got too comfortable and let his guard down by leaving the working script with his and Betty's name on it on his nightstand where Norma read it. So at this point, Joe is fed up and starts packing a bag while telling her she is a 50-year-old woman and to grow up, and that there was not going to be a comeback for her. She had no fans, and that all her fan mail was written by her butler, Max. As he's leaving, she runs out after him with a gun in her hand, which leads to a tragic end. Now, when the police come to question her and take her in, she is so out of touch with reality now that she thinks all the police and all the reporters with their cameras were actually there to film her comeback to the big screen. I especially like this movie, and it might be because, well, I'm old now, because when I was younger, I couldn't stand to watch a black and white film. But these classics have a certain appeal or realism to them that you rarely see in today's overacted, over-dramatized movies, even the TV shows. The acting in this movie by all the character is not overdone. I think it is spot on flawless. That's why this movie truly is a classic. This concludes my review for the film Sunset Boulevard. Until we meet again.